Hello, everyone. I'm Rabbi Julia Andelman, Director of Community Engagement at JTS, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's session of our Monday series, The Other in Jewish Text and Tradition. A special welcome to any first time attendees. If you'd like to view recordings of past sessions, you can do that using the link that you received in um, the email from Lynn Feynman this morning. Um, today's session is Different but Equal, The Paradox of Chosenness with Professor Alan Cooper, um, Elaine Ravitch Professor of Jewish Studies. I smile when I say his name because I love studying with him. Um, we want to, and I think, he, I think you will too, although you, uh, many of you know him already from previous sessions. Um, um, we want to express our gratitude to our sponsors for today's session. We have two um, sponsors at the Chacham level, um, Beatrice and Harold Jacobson, in honor of the learning opportunities offered by JTS to the Jewish community and Linda Zisk in loving memory of David Zisk, Zichrono Libracha. Thank you so much um, to both of you. Um, and if you are feeling inspired uh, to, by this opportunity to engage in Jewish learning with JTS's Outstanding Scholars, we would like to invite you to partner with us in sponsoring a learning session. We have two sponsorship levels, Chacham for $540 and Sadiq for $1,000. And you can learn more uh, by contacting learninglives at jtsa.edu. And uh, in a few minutes, we'll put information in the chat as well. Um, I will now turn things over to Tani schwartz Herman who will give us some instructions before we begin the class. Thank you, Rabbi Andelman. Um, so uh, just to quickly go over the uh, Q&A, uh, Dr. Cooper will pause for questions periodically throughout the class. Uh, we will also have a Q&A period at the end. You can use the chat feature to submit your questions to Rabbi Julia Andelman. To open the chat, hover your cursor over the bottom of the Zoom screen and click on the chat icon. Uh, during the Q&A period, Rabbi Andelman will select a few of the questions to present to Dr. Cooper. Uh, please note that you will only be able to chat with JTS staff. You will not be able to send messages to the group or to Dr. Cooper directly. For technical and logistical questions, please initiate a private chat with myself or with Lynn Feynman. Uh, the sources for today's class were in the email that you received with the Zoom link for the session. Uh, we will also post the link shortly in the chat and Dr. Cooper will be uh, screen sharing the sources as well. Um, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Alan Cooper, the Elaine Ravage Professor of Jewish Studies at JTS. Uh, he served as provost of JTS from 2007 to 2018. Dr. Cooper earned his doctorate in religious studies from Yale University, focusing on the linguistic structure of biblical poetry. Dr. Cooper's publications include many articles on biblical poetics and the history of inter interpretation. His work in progress includes a commentary on the selection of, of Psalms for the Jewish Publication Society. Um, and you can read uh, his full bio um, in the sources as well. Um, I am going to go ahead now and, and turn it over to Dr. Cooper. Thank you very much, Tani. Thank you, Rabbi Andelman. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'd like to begin with a bracha, Baruch Atadonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kiddushanu V'mitzvotav, V'tzivanu La'asok V'divrei Torah. It's a pleasure and an honor to have this uh, privilege of studying Torah with you. I'd like to thank our community engagement department and in a particular word of thanks to my friends, the Jacobsons, for uh, uh, sponsoring this talk. Uh, it's a wonderful thing that they're doing and uh, I'm so grateful for this opportunity to learn with you. Well, for some bizarre reason, when Rabbi Andelman approached me about participating, I selected one of the more fraught topics in the history of Jewish thought, namely the, 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 the matter of election. But it's been very much on my mind in recent months and years because of the way the topic actually imbues so much of what's going on in our society right now. And so what I'd like to do is share the screen and, and, and begin what I hope will be a provocative and not offensive 
discussion of a very difficult topic uh, with a recent reflection on the topic from uh, someone who only uh, came later in life to learn that she had uh, a Jewish ancestry uh, and became a very prominent member of uh, our government at, uh, for a period of time. I'm referring to our former Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, who just published this uh, article in the most recent uh, issue of Time Magazine, actually the one that goes off the newsstands today. Uh, and it came in to me, to my attention, too late for me to be able to include it in the handout. So this comes from version two of the handout, which you don't have, but which I'd like to share a few paragraphs with you. So here is uh, uh, Secretary Albright reflecting on the events of January 6th with shock, sadness, and hope, as she says. And she says, it might be wise to reflect on the two most dangerous words in the human vocabulary, us and them. Last week, we received a dramatic reminder of this peril when our nation's political divisions erupted into a spectacle of law lawlessness on Capitol Hill. Then she goes on, two more paragraphs. The impulse to choose sides is inherent in our species. Psychologists point to our desire to be safe by joining groups with which we have an affinity, our fear of the unknown and our vanity. We want to think of ourselves as better or smarter than the other. In other words, there's always a kind of a relative relationship between self and other, which is manifest in notions of superiority or inferiority. I might go so far as to say that uh, throughout most of the history of notions of chosenness and election, doctrines of election have been promulgated by elites who want to justify their position on the one hand, or by people uh, who are powerless and oppressed who want to justify their aspirations on the other hand. So in other words, it's inequality that often motivates the very concept of chosenness or election itself. And uh, Secretary Albright suggests that these traits are ingrained. For better or worse, we're clannish beings. I like the way she says for better or worse, because one can't deny the occasional advantages as well. This has done much to shape our history. But now comes her prescription, which I think is sophisticated and interesting. Uh, the problem is it may not be doable, but that's beside the point. We must acknowledge that our divisions extend far beyond matters of political affiliation to include religion, race, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and urban versus rural. I'm um, pausing for a moment to observe how odd it is that she leaves out uh, uh, financial well-being. Uh, or rather class distinction by e on economic criteria, because uh, that seems to be one of the most severe problems in our society today, namely income inequality, earning inequality. Uh, but she leaves it out. Confronted by this reality, many citizens are tempted either to retreat more deeply into their respective group identities or to insist piously that such categories are irrelevant and should not matter. Uh, and those do indeed represent two extremes that we find, especially throughout the history of liberal and conservative thinking, uh, in, uh, particularly in the 19th, 20th, and now 21st centuries. Neither approach works. And that's where I think I have my strongest sense of agreement with Secretary Albright. Neither approach works. Exacerbating differences is one road to disaster. Denying them is another. Instead of fantasizing about a harmony that is out of reach, we should focus on ensuring that our inevitable disagreements lead whenever possible to constructive outcomes. I thought that was a good starting point for today's conversation, uh, uh, although my uh, response in two words to Secretary Albright's conclusion is, if only. In other words, if only her prescription actually could be achieved in real in the real world. So with that, what I'd like to do is pass on to a more focused discussion of Jewish ideas about 
chosenness and election, where they come from and where they're going, uh, I still stick by the question mark in my title, Different But Equal, The Paradox of Chosenness. And uh, I'm ultimately going to conclude that uh, pretty much all, if not absolutely all, notions of difference uh, tend out, turn out to be hierarchical. Uh, in other words, that the possibility of uh, difference also manifesting a genuine egalitarianism, a true sense of equality, despite professions along those lines, turn out to be figments. Um, uh, I remember our children occasionally used to talk about being the same only different, which is a wonderful paradox or oxymoron that I like to hold on to. And I also remember reading to them a lovely poem by Ruth Krauss when they were little, in which uh, uh, Ms. Krauss talked about how I love you both, my honeys. I love you both the best. I love you both the best, if only. So let's talk about the very paradigm in the Bible of uh, the impossibility of equality, which of course comes from the twins. Jacob and Esau. Uh, already in the Bible, Jacob is understood typologically, not merely as a single human being, but also as the progenitor of Israel and ultimately as the progenitor of the Jewish people. So we're B'nai Yisrael, where the Israelites were the fictive descendants of Jacob. And Esau is already, at, at the time of his birth narrative, uh, understood to be the eponymous ancestor of the nation of Edom, Edom, as it's usually pronounced in English. And through time, Edom comes to be identified with Rome. And then as Rome becomes Christian, uh, Esau, Edom, Rome, uh, stands for Christianity. So there's always, even from biblical times, a typological reading of these characters. So the way in which one relates to the Jewish people is going to be uh, a, an important factor in the way one interprets Jacob in the biblical stories. And likewise, the way one interprets the relationship with the adversaries, the Edomites, which can be fraught in biblical times, and then later the Romans, and then finally the Christians, uh, the way one understands those historical relations will be the way in which will motivate the way one interprets the biblical texts and to a considerable extent vice versa. And the nub of the matter comes with the two twins jostling in Rebecca's womb, which causes Rebecca such consternation that she requests an oracle from God and she receives uh, this pithy little statement here in Genesis chapter 25, verse 23. And here's the Jewish publication uh, society translation. Two nations are in your womb. Two separate peoples shall issue from your body. Note the terms that are used for nationalities. Goy and Laom, Goyim, Laumim. These are political terms. Uh, they do not necessarily carry with them the connotation of kinship relations or fictive kinship relations that define a people, which we would call an am, which is defined by kinship rather than political ties. And that's clearly intentional because, after all, these two are, two are kin, and yet they are distinct in the way in which they form political enemy, uh, entities that are distinct from their obvious kinship relationship. Of course, twins are always a kind of peculiarity in the way in which they represent test cases for similarity and difference. Uh, and do we know if Jacob and Esau were fraternal twins or identical twins? The Bible seems to imply that they're different, but we don't actually know from a biological point of view. We don't know what color Jacob's hair was when he emerged from the womb. We only know what color Esau's hair was because the Bible tells us that. And we know what Esau does for a living because we are taught about his skill, but we don't have any idea what Jacob does except sit around in a tent, which uh, has to be subject to interpretation. Anyway, here's the oracle, and you can see how the Jewish publication tra society translates it. 
One people shall be mightier than the other, the older shall serve the younger. So it looks like the Oracle is predicting the flip-flop of the notion of primogeniture so that uh, the general uh, uh, assumption of a primogeniture, namely the ascendancy of the elder child will be subverted and the younger child will uh, 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 predominate in this case. There are many things to note about this, but we only have 90 minutes. So we're not gonna talk about all of those things. But one thing I wanna notice is the asymmetry of the terms Rav and Sa'ir, which do not mean elder and younger. They mean greater and maybe younger or maybe lesser or maybe not, but they're not symmetrical terms. That is to say that it's not like the story of the uh, sisters, Rachel and Leah, Rachel and Leah, in the uh, uh, story about Laban and his encounter with Jacob, where they're called Bechira and Sira, which are the symmetrical terms connoting chronological age, the elder in age and the younger in age. These terms are more ambiguous. So let's look at some commentary. Here's Chizkia ben Manoach, French commentator of the 13th century, uh, on this verse. Kan nigzar al Yaakov gvir So here it's decreed concerning Jacob that he'll be a ruler to his brother. In other words, it's not contingent. It's simply a, uh, a declaration of ascendancy on Jacob's part. But then Chizkuni uh, quotes an earlier Midrashic interpretation. Rav Huna said, when Jacob is worthy, Zachai Yaakov, the elder shall serve the younger. If not, the elder shall be served by the younger. Now that's really interesting because the first comment seems to presuppose an innate characteristic with which Jacob is imbued, the characteristic of rulership, which is simply by dint of divine choice. But Rav Huna says that that choice is actually contingent on the way in which Jacob uh, uh, behaves. He, in other words, he will only assume rulership if he is worthy, zacha, without any further definition of the term. But this becomes part of the essence of the debate over chosenness throughout Jewish history. Namely, is it simply a, an, in, or an unalterable fact of Jewish existence and identity, or is it contingent? Is it subject to the manner in which, uh, a J, in which Jacob, Israel, the Jewish people act or behave, uh, and depending on their action, that uh, election, elected status might conceivably be withdrawn. More elaborate comment along similar lines is the comment of Radak, David Kimchi. And to know something about his historical setting is very important because he's living in a very difficult time in Jewish-Christian relations. And Kimchi himself, like his father before him, is actively engaged in anti-Christian polemic. So we surely will expect that some of that will come out in the way in which he interprets the relationship between the brothers. I wanna see, I want you to look closely at this commentary with me. Okay, so, it'll seem as soon as they come out of your womb, they will appear separate from one another. Simply quoting and paraphrasing verse 25, one will be reddish with a hairy mantle all over. And like there's a normal and an abnormal status, abnormal being being born covered with red fuzz and normal being unmarked, nothing said. There's absolutely no basis for his saying that. In other words, this particular aspect of difference is unjustified by anything that's explicit in the biblical text. It's an inference that may or may not be legitimate. And look how he continues. And so also they will be separate in their activities when they grow up. And then, of course, we, we know the famous description of Esau as a skillful hunter and the other as a mild man. Now, uh, what, what, just remind me how you get a PhD in mildness that embarks you with a kind of a skill or something that you can do 
uh, in your life. He's an East Tom Yoshevo Halim. He's a tent sitter. Uh, we know that he knows how to cook because we find him later on in the story preparing a lentil stew. Uh, and, uh, and there are all kinds of ways of interpreting this, but the way in which it's traditionally received, as most of you probably know, is that he's a kind of yeshiva buffer. He's a studious type who stays indoors and he devotes himself to study and observance, none of which is explicit or even really implicit in the way in which he's described. So you've got one guy with a skill, one guy who doesn't seem to have one. You've got a notion that there's a physical difference between them, even though none is explicitly stated in the text here. And then one people shall be mightier than the other. And here's one of the most important statements in the history of the reception. Le'olam lo yihyu shavim b'cholet. In other words, if you have any notion that there will ever be uh, equality between these two brothers, forget about it. So whichever one happens to be ascendant at one moment or another, someone else will be subordinate. The idea of there ever being equal is simply not taken into consideration. This is not a text that is sympathetic or friendly to those of an egalitarian bent. But then again, neither is practically anything else in the pre-modern uh, biblical and subsequent Jewish traditions. It's only post-enlightenment that we start to find notions of egalitarianism and efforts to revise uh, notions of election and chosenness, chosenness in the light of them that we see emerging in Judaism. And now comes one of the most brilliant interpretations of the oracle, which has had a tremendous impact on some modern commentators. In Kimchi's interpretation of the phrase, Varav Yavod Sa'ir, which you remember the JPS translated, the elder shall serve the younger, uh, without any doubt, uh, despite Rav Huna's demurral. I'm sorry for those of you who don't know any Hebrew grammar, but it's time to go out and study Hebrew then. Uh, and what he observes is that this is not a statement in which the subject and object are clear. It depends on how you interpret the word order. Elder, greater, serve, younger. It could be SVO, subject, verb, object, or object, verb, subject. And you don't know which is the correct interpretation. So it could be either, it could be both. That ambiguity has played significantly into many modern interpretations of the story. So there's no et marking the direct object. So it's problematic and doesn't clarify who will serve whom. Does the Rav serve the Tzair? Does the Tzair serve the Rav? Maybe you could say the quote unquote normal word order would be SVO, subject, verb, object, which would mean you might uh, find a bit of clarification in uh, interpreting the Rav, the elder, as the uh, subject. So the elder will serve the younger. But then he goes on to say, The meaning is not clarified in this particular prophecy. Sometimes the Rav will serve the Tzair, as in the time of David. Sometimes the Tzair will serve the Rav, as nowadays, writing from the perspective of a Jew living in uh, Christian Narbonne. The implication of the word order is that most of the time, the Rav will serve the Tzair, and thus it shall be after I return from captivity. So messianic thinking, apocalyptic thinking about the return of the Jews from their exile and diaspora to the land of Israel where they will hold sway and then the flip-flop will occur. Remember the concept that each one could be the equal of the other in their respective places is never contemplated anywhere in the history of reception of this text. Finally, when we come to, on this topic, when we come to the notion here of what God thinks about all of this, we come to uh, one of the very latest of the biblical prophetic texts, Malachi chapter one, verse two to three. Ahavti etchem amar Adonai, va'amartem bama ahavtanu. Halo ach esav liyakov neum Adonai, va'ohav et Yaakov. Look at how uh, the JPS translation tries to uh, soften the language. Esau is Jacob's brother. 
that I have accepted Jacob. I think most of you probably would it, it would it would would translate ahave as love, not accept, which seems rather mild. And I have rejected, which is saneti, which most people would take to be hated Esau. I have made his hills a desolation, his territory a home for beasts of the desert. And of course, this is reflective of the relationship between the Edomites and the Israelites, or Judeans rather, at the end of the first temple period and into the interim period when uh, some vestiges of the Judean community remained in the land of Israel while others went to, into exile in Babylonia. Some of them went down to Egypt uh, and the Edomites treated those who remained miserably, thus incurring divine wrath according to this. And you can see some of this also in the book of Obadiah, the book of Ovadja, which once again is an oracle against Edom. As I said at the beginning, there's this typological understanding of the identities of Jacob and Esau that infuses the biblical tradition as well as the post-biblical traditions. So let's look at Radak. We already know where he's gonna stand. On Malachi uh, chapter one, verses two to three, the interpretation is that should you say, how have you shown us love? Wasn't Esau a brother to Jacob? They were brothers, sons of Isaac who loved me. In other words, they're descended from an individual who was uh, unequivocal in love of, uh, of, of uh, uh, God as uh, is asserted here. And I chose uvacharti biakov uvzaro acharav afal pishehe machisimoti. So Radak suggests that the divine choice of Jacob over Esau was not a matter of any innate quality that Jacob possessed or the actions that Jacob performed, but was what God decided to do despite the fact that the Jewish people continue to vex God and anger God. So it looks from this paragraph like an arbitrary decision on God's part. Here are these people who continually vex me and yet I chose them and I decided to give them the land. On the other hand, in other words, because of the uh, terrible things that Esau and Esau's descendants, the Romans and the Christians, have done to the Jews, I have rejected them and vowed to destroy their land. So you can see the way he puts this, it's, it's very clear um, uh, that who continued to commit evil against Israel and rejoiced in their destruction and exile. And when he says their destruction and exile, of course, he's talking about the biblical period, but he's also talking about the contemporary circumstances in which he himself uh, lives. Uh, finally, on this topic, I wanted to take a quick look at a barbanel, simply because a barbanel closes the circle. In other words, he draws the prophetic text back into relation with what the text already told us about the relationship between the two brothers in uh, chapter 25 in the Oracle to Rebecca. For God's hatred of Esau, God will perpetually ruin and devastate his land. A Barbanel is, of course, a member of Dorgeru Sfarad. So you have the most virulent uh, distinctions made between uh, Jacob and Esau, particularly related to Judaism and Christianity. In the cases of Radak, who lives in a time of intense Jewish Christian disputation, and in the part of a Barbanel, who belongs to the generation that was expelled from Spain and Portugal and is now living in exile himself. For God's hatred of Esau, God will perpetually ruin and devastate his land. Don't take this to be a one-time thing in the biblical period. This is gonna be go ongoing as we are on the verge of the uh, messianic period and the ingathering of the exiles and the vindication of the Jews, which is what a Barbanel thinks. This encompasses what was said when the brothers Jacob and Esau were struggling with one another as the Torah revealed in the story of their gestation. That story proves 
that they will be perpetually in a state of enmity and hatred. When one rises, the other falls. From even prior to birth, they hated one another to the extent that at birth, Jacob was grasping Esau's heel to indicate that they would be struggling with one another forever. Noldu shnehem, the two were born, bimzagim, mitchalafim, vizotarim, vitachlit, hachiluf. There's almost a, a Dickensian overkill in that profusion of terms that denotes such radical difference that it can never be overcome. And it starts from before the womb and continues from a Barbanel's point of view to the present day. Okay, with that, I'll stop to see what comments and questions uh, we have that I might take up. Uh, so Rabbi Endelman and Tani, is there something that I should uh, address now? Sure. Um, well, I have some, I have some general um, sort of conceptual questions about chosenness. I don't know if you wanna take those now or later. I don't know if I want to take them at all. But you <laughs> okay. Might as well, ask. Um, all right, well, let me ask something a little more specific just about, about the text you were just doing. Um, there, there's some, I'm trying to synthesize a few different questions, but I guess people are, are trying to probe this idea of, um, of chosenness as being based on, on kind of worthy behavior and the fact that that doesn't seem to... Um, you know, have, have we always behaved so so um, worthily, and and um, does our chosenness break down when our behavior breaks down? Uh, that's a wonderful that's a wonderful question, and uh, the reason it's a wonderful question is because there's no real answer to it, but we're going to see it addressed head on later on, which is why I'm scrolling down here. Um, and it's related particularly to the most famous of the chosenness texts, Exodus 19.5. Just look how this is phrased. Um, I, for some reason, I didn't put the whole translation in this, but this is, uh, you know, the famous, uh, you have seen um, uh, what I did to Mitzrayim, to Egypt, when I bore you on uh, the, wings of, the wings of eagles, which aren't really eagles, and brought you to me. And now, if you will obey me faithfully and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the people. This is, this is one of the primary election traditions. And notice that it's contingent. It's conditional. It couldn't be clear. So where does the notion arise that we're elect irrespective of our, of our behavior? And that's going to be a paradox and a problem that's going to be raised again and again, especially by authorities in the modern period. And we come to the very end of our time. Let me just do this because it's a, such an important question. Here we have one of, I think, one of the most profound modern thinkers on the notion of choice and election and interreligious relations, Alon Goshen Gottstein, talking about this fundamental tension, uh, the tension between a status that is inherent unto itself and the mission that sees Israel's particularity as a function of its service to others. That is really interesting. And then look at this, at the question at the bottom. Can we speak of a kingdom of priests when large parts of the people do not follow the priestly vocation of dedication to God? Bingo! But he puts it in the form of a question, a rhetorical question, because some people might say, well, yeah, and then they have to go on to elaborate and say, well, yeah, in the following respects or for the following reason or whatever, but it's a conundrum. So I wanna thank the person who asked that question for bringing it to the fore. I was gonna to get to it later, but it's really valuable to uh, have it on the table even now. Uh, uh, you wanna take one more? Yeah, one, why not one more? Okay, I have a few questions about, um, about Ishmael as the, father of, of Islam and Asaph is the father of the Roman slash Christian slash Western world. And I guess um, there, people are asking about that from a few different angles, but maybe maybe one way of taking it is, um, do, you want to do you want to talk about the rabbis 
um, the rabbi's understanding of that, you know, their equation of these characters with these later um, religions, why is it important for them to trace those religions to the, you know, to these earliest narratives of the Bible or, or anything else you want to um, say about those connections that you think is important for us to understand right now? Yeah, that's a, that's a really wonderful question, but but I'm gonna I'm gonna refrain from speaking in broad general terms. And what I want to do is just say a word about Ishmael. Uh, obviously, the whole uh, bi the biblical and the early rabbinic tradition does not deal in particularly typological ways with Ishmael. That only becomes an issue with the rise of Islam in the seventh century CE. And there is a wonderful book that was based. I'm happy to say on a JTS doctoral dissertation that was directed uh, by Professor Bert Vizotsky by Carol Bachhos, that's spelled B-A-K-H-O-S, uh, who is now a professor of Jewish studies at the University of California, Los Angeles. And it's precisely about the treatment of, of Yishmael in typological terms. And what she observes among many, many uh, interesting and profound things is that, um, is that uh, there's not nearly the kind of hostility expressed towards Yishmael as there is towards Edom Rome Christianity, uh, particularly not in the early rabbinic tradition because there wouldn't have been any reason to, to do so. So for example, you have reconciliation stories in Genesis, one of which seems to put Esau in a pretty good light after Jacob has his encounter with the angelic being or whatever it is, and then they reconcile and Esau shows considerable generosity to Jacob and so forth and so forth. And Ishmael uh, uh, reunites with Isaac when they bury their father. And, and that is treated very sympathetically by the rabbis, but the reconciliation in the Bible of Esau and Jacob is not treated benignly by the rabbis. Rather, they see uh, Esau as remaining duplicitous and antagonistic towards Jacob, uh, reading against what looks to me like the plain sense of the scripture. So there just isn't that hostility towards Ishmael, and there's no reason for it prior to the rise of Islam. But again, I recommend, you know, people like um, uh, uh, Reuven Firestone of uh, Hebrew Union College in Los Angeles, who writes uh, very nicely about the interaction of Judaism and Islam in their respective receptions of biblical stories and characters. And then uh, Carol Bacchus's, uh, a dissertation uh, in the form of a published book on this uh, tremendous difference in the rabbinic treatment of Ishmael in contrast to uh, Esau. It's a fasc fascinating question. I mean, uh, the Bible itself, particularly in medieval times, is understood to provide us with what we might call the map of all of Jewish history and all of Jewish life, whether it be in the matter of, uh, of, of, of an anchor in historical events and episodes that keep recurring in one way or another, or whether it be in the foundations of law that provide us with our way of life and our uh, various observances. All that is anchored in scripture, even though we all recognize that uh, that scripture is considerably modified and reinterpreted by the rabbinic and post-rabbinic traditions. So, okay, so I, I think that th those are wonderful questions and thank you. And now I'd like to talk about the stuff that's X-rated, uh, which is, uh, I've, I've put under the, under the heading of dehumanizing the other. I hardly have to tell you what a category of, uh, a category of uh, expression of pre prejudice and, and, and uh, racism and the like uh, that is throughout society. Um, and here's this passage in Ezekiel chapter 34 that you would never expect to be at the root of ideas concerning dehumanization of the other. And as I say, whoops, what did I just do? I just pause my screen sharing. How do I do this? Uh, let me see, let's go back. Okay, now I can see my text again. Can you see my text? Okay. So, um, well, let's see. Uh, yeah, in footnote three here, 
Ezekiel 34 is an oracle condemning the shepherds who have allowed the Israelite flock to go astray. I don't have to go into detail about this metaphor, which you know, it's so widespread. And by way of restoration, God will rescue the flock and appoint a new Davidic shepherd to tend them properly. So these are the concluding verses of the chapter. Very beautiful. They shall no longer be spoiled for the nations and the beasts of the earth shall not devour them. They shall dwell secure and untroubled, et cetera, et cetera. And then comes this peculiar conclusion. They shall know, Yadu ki ani Adonai Elohehem, that I, I, Adonai, their God, am with them, and they, house of Israel, are my people. You, my flock, flock that I tend, are men. Aten toni, ton mariti, adam atem, ani, Elohechem ne'um Adonai Elohim. Okay, so uh, obviously this is just uh, rendering the parable literal. That is to say, you're not really sheep, you're really human beings. And I've been telling you this in the form of a parable all along, but that's not the way it's going to be taken in the history of reception. Why the peculiar use here of Adam? which of course is the general term from humanity, for humanity, humankind, from the beginning of the book of Genesis. Why use that here? So here's Radak, our old friend, uh, and we know he, what direction he's likely to take. When you become the flock that I tend with knowledge, understanding, and intelligence, you will be called human. It's like the testimony of uh, a rationalist who descended from a long line of intellectuals who came from Andalus uh, and who still manifest this idea that we are in the image of God in the sense that we strive to perfect our intellects, that we are creatures of rationality, knowledge, understanding, intelligence, dea, bina, haskel. That's what makes us human. That's what differentiates us from beasts, okay? When the good that God intends for us comes upon us and the world is filled with knowledge of God, and the intention to love God and serve God wholeheartedly and we preoccupy ourselves with the intelligible. That is to say, we, we spend ourselves cogitating rationally about what's true and what's real. When we, when we do those things, as Nikare Adam. That's what makes us human. So the rationalist, the Maimonidean rationalist quest to be fully human is this quest to perfect, in the Jewish context, our intellects. And uh, those who don't strive after that, that's what uh, activates the human portion of us, the ye nivdalim min Okay, so we'll be different from beasts and from people who are bestial. That is to say, there are some people who are human because they're engaged in this striving. And then there are other people who are really just beasts in human form. They're not truly human. Jonathan translated, that's to say, the ancient Aramaic translation of the, this verse uh, in Ezekiel. You are my people, Aton Ami, the people called by my name. You are house of Israel. Accordingly, al derech hazeh amru rabotenu zal, adam atem, atem kuyin adam, ve'en akum, ovdei kochavimu masalot, the rabbinic shorthand for idolaters or Gentiles. They're not human. They're not called human. So you're human because... You're in service to God's name. You bear God's name. Your God's elect. Your God's flock. These others are comparable to beasts, and they are not human. Where on earth does he get that? That idea of Gentiles not being human? Well, actually, it is an extrapolation from an, a text in the Talmud. And that's here in, again, a very unlikely source in Yevamot 61a that's talking about a detail in the laws of purity and impurity. And uh, because it's so useful, I, I've quoted this from Safaria with the Steinsalt gloss that makes it much clearer. 
But you can see this, Kivrei Goyim, a non in Ba'ohel. It's a very straightforward uh, statement in regard to the laws of purity and impurity. The graves of Gentiles do not render items impure through a tent. As it is stated, and you, my sheep, the sheep of my pasture, are men. That's a head scratcher. What on earth does that verse have to do with the question of corpse impurity by secondary contact with uh, a Gentile? Well, from which it is derived that you, the Jewish people, that's Steinsals, the Jewish people are called Adam, human, but Gentiles are not called human. This is restricted in the Gemara to a particular technical matter of corpse impurity. And it's immediately disputed there in the Gemara. And not only that, but it could be juxtaposed with other Talmudic texts that express much more favorable opinions about the relationship between Jews and Gentiles. So here's again, the most famous one often cited in Sanhedrin 59a, Rabbi, Meir sa Rabbi Yochanan says, a Gentile who engages in Torah study is liable to receive the death penalty. And Rabbi Meir immediately objects, from where is it derived that even a Gentile who engages in Torah study is considered like a high priest? Well, it's derived from a verse in Leviticus that says that when you keep my statutes and ordinances, which if, Asher ya'aseh otam ha'adam v'chai, which if an adam, a human being, does, they shall live by them. It doesn't say, says Rabbi Meir, which if priests, Levites, and Israelites do, they shall live by them. It says humans. That means that the Torah is available and accessible even to humanity in general. Now, this is going to get hedged in by the commentators who will say that, well, Torah for Gentiles, really doesn't refer to the whole Torah. Really what it refers to are the specific commands that are addressed to so-called Noahide commandments, the seven commandments that are addressed to all of humanity as opposed to the specific commandments addressed to the Jewish people. But that's not what the Gemara says. What you say, what the Gemara says is afilu oveid kochavim vaoseik batorah harehu kakohen gadol. A Gentile who engages in Torah study is like a high priest. And I want you to juxtapose that and the parallel use of the term Adam to be restrictive to Jews only in one Gemara text and here to be expansive to include the possibility of Torah learning for Gentiles in this other Talmudic text. But when we come to controversial treatments, what we're gonna find is a reversion to the dehumanizing understanding of Adam as exclusive to the Jewish people. And that brings us to the most virulent expression of that idea that I know in uh, a sermon by uh, a great scholar of the 16th century named Isaac Adarby. Look at his dates uh, and look at the footnote. He was preacher of the Congregation of Lisbon Jews and later rabbi of Congregation Shalom in Salonika. So he's living in Salonika. He's living in the Ottoman Empire in a Muslim environment where the Jews have been welcomed, uh, uh, having been exiled from the Iberian Peninsula. And you can see, born in around 1510, he belongs to the first generation of uh, diaspora Jews from the Iberian Peninsula who were born in exile. Uh, so he, there's no love loss between a Darby and the Christians. And so he's not going to be very favorable to them. And when he's talking about the idolatrous Gentiles, Umota Olam of De Elilim, he's talking primarily about Christians because remember that in, the, in, in standard Jewish understanding, Muslims are not considered to be idolaters. Uh, Muslims are monotheists but Christians are idolaters. Christians, because of the Trinity mainly, are uh, not considered to be monotheists like Jews and Muslims. So this comes from the, to me, ironically named Divrei Shalom, Words of Peace, uh, which is a collection of 30 sermons, first published pro probably during his lifetime in Salonika in 1580. Those of you who uh, know about Hebrewbooks.org, 
uh, you can actually find a scan of the 1580 edition or the Venice editions uh, there online, should you uh, want to take a look at them. And then it, it was reprinted in 1893 in Warsaw and not since then, as far as I know. Sermon number three, which is the source for this, is intended to demonstrate that the Torah is essential. That is to say, it's part of our human nature, part of our human being, which you could then invert that and say, in order to be human, you have to be imbued with Torah. It's not accidental. It's something you acquire uh, that's not innate in you. Uh, so he argues this in this sermon. And this sermon is omitted from the collection of his sermons that was reprinted in Warsaw in 1893. And that occasioned so much uh, interest that there was actually a whole article by Shaul Regev published in 2013, in which he discusses the differences between the respective Salonika, Venice, and Warsaw editions. And he observes that this sermon is omitted from the Warsaw edition, everything else is retained, and he can't explain it. But I think the explanation is exactly what we're about to read, that it's considered so virulent that it uh, simply was considered not fit for publication. We see the idolatrous Gentiles standing firm, omdim al tilam zulat Torah, without Torah. We say the truth is that Gentiles, ha'umot, kevan she'en lahem or Torah, enam nikra'im adam, kemosha amru chazal. And then he reverts to the verse in Ezekiel that we've been discussing up until now. So Gentiles, lacking the light of Torah, are not called human. So they're not human beings. And then he quotes the Ezekiel verse. The intention is to say, and this is where he goes beyond anything else that I know, that some sheep are intended for slaughter and others to produce wool, milk, and offspring. So it says in Ezekiel, I tend my flock, that's to say the sheep that I intend to preserve, not the sheep intended for slaughter, but the flock that I tend. In other words, the one that provides my parnasah, right? Parnasti she'ina omedet l'tvicha, as it were, Yisrael mefarnasim lakadosh baruch Hu. So Israel sustains the Holy One, which would be a standard notion related to uh, post-Kabbalistic uh, theurgy, which is the idea that God depends on our support for sustenance in certain ways, just as uh, we depend on God for our support and sustenances. One who is termed human must possess this Torah, Israel. It's the particular gift of God to the Jewish people, according to Deuteronomy. And so to be in possession of it, that is to say, to have it innate within you is like a way of defining you as Jewish. It's an absolutely astounding statement. So they are material without the form, particular humanity. They're like lumps of clay. They're like the behemah, the beasts to whom Kimchi refers. Moreover, he says, not just that, lozo levad. Remember, this comes from a sermon. He's really getting, getting himself wound up here. They're being devoid of Torah. They're not real. It's like, like the, the non-Jews, the Gentiles, and specifically the Christians, do not have earthly reality. They have no form. They're just like lumps comparable to beasts and they don't have real existence, citing this rather virulent verse from Isaiah chapter 40, kol hagoyim ke'ayin negdo me'efes vatohu nechshivu lo, uh, which accounts them less than nothing. So the sages said, the wicked while alive are called dead. Harsha'im b'chayihem kuyim metim, shechevan, since Torah is true life, in their being without it, they're dead. They're dead, they're formless. Uh, this 
leads us finally. So we've moved from difference with no possibility of equality with the messianic hope in ultimate Jewish vindication and rulership to a virulent dehumanization of the Gentiles and particularly the Christians who remember put it in historical context are responsible for the massive disruption of Jewish life, their expulsion from the Iberian Peninsula and the desperate efforts on the part of Jews now in exile in the Ottoman Empire to restore, uh, to retain the semblances of their prior existence and move on. Uh, so finally, that brings us then to the Exodus 19 text that we already discussed before. Uh, but I think this is a, a good moment to stop uh, if there are questions, but uh, please don't ask me to defend uh, a Darby because I'm not prepared to do that. What I wanna do is illustrate the extremes to which Jewish dehumanization of the other is coupled with the doctrine of election in times when Jews feel particularly powerless and oppressed. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm reeling from that text that you just <laughs> that you just went through. Um, I'm just trying to look if there if there are questions that are kind of directly on this. Um, well, I guess yeah. I, there's a question from Linda. Does any part of Judaism today believe in slash preach what a Darby preached? More or less, yes. Maybe not in such radical terms, but the notion of difference and superiority manifest in Torah and observance, uh, and uh, um, discussed with what are called the the ways of the Gentiles. You know, whether it's what they eat or the way in which they have sex or uh, uh, various other aspects of their life being described as bestial. Uh, yes, I mean, you, you still find that in the Jewish world. And you find more benign views of that, even among liberal Jews, feelings of uh, superiority based on certain ways of thinking or certain modes of behavior. How could they possibly, and then you fill in the blank, or Jews would never do that, right? I, I'm still, I, I, I mean, this is not, not, a, not an occasion for humor, but I do remember uh, from some specific incidents that have occurred to me during my life, that when you, when you hear uh, the phrase from an interlocutor, Kulan Yehudim, that's usually from someone, we're all Jews, that's usually from someone who's trying to cheat you. <laughs> Right, I remember this. I re we, I had a I had an, an encounter with an art dealer once many years ago, who wanted to sell me a painting for cash and didn't want to give me a receipt. So I said, "Well, come on, isn't this just normal?" And he says, "What's bothering you, Mama We're all Jews, which was my signal that he was definitely trying to cheat us. <laughs> it's a great story. Um, Okay, so now I'm getting a lot of reactions to the text. Um, so let me share a few with you and you can kind of sure. uh, respond what you want, respond to what you want to respond to. Um, so Alan and Yael are asking, is this, um, is it a reaction to having just lived through the devastation of the expulsion? Um, there are questions from Stephen and Catherine about um, how common this view was were, were other Jewish leaders sharing this view was were, or were people at the time presenting uh, you know counter opinions um, and yeah some uh, someone named Julia is um, kind of sympathizing with with the position with his position that um, you know putting herself in the situation of having her humanity feel like her humanity has just been taken away by Christians um, the, the hatefulness there, maybe it's something that we can um, relate to. And then um, a few people are also talking about these kinds of feelings within Judaism. Um, and certain groups looking, looking 
down in pretty severe ways on other groups. And uh, now they're all flowing in. I'll just share one more. Um, Arnold is writing, the most disturbing part of the text is um, it's common understanding that Germans saw Jews as less than human and somehow saw their wholesale murder as acceptable. It's astounding that Jews of some credibility um, had similar views of Christians. And I think, um, you know, what I was thinking while you were, while, while you were going through that text, um, you know, I, I think it, it, part, part of what inspired this series is just how, how degraded the language has come has become um, in the U.S. today, and 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 speaking of of other people with with animalistic and dehumanizing language. So there's a whole bunch of reactions to the text. If you want to pick something to respond to, well, those are those are beautiful and significant uh, reactions, and uh, I and uh, each one of them deserves an individual response. When I think of dehumanization, I think about you know. Well, you know how they're saying nowadays that every every generation is defined usually by one incident that kind of shapes their whole sense of being. And you know, people, I guess, in their uh, teens and twenties now, or you know, their identities are going to be shaped forever by what's been going on between the political turmoil and the pandemic. For me, it was Vietnam, and one of the things I most vividly remember about Vietnam was. The, the dehumanization of the Vietnamese people, even the ones who are our allies, that made it so easy to be dismissive of them and made it uh, so easy to destroy their environment and bomb their cities and treat them as if they were not human or less than human uh, and call them gooks. I remember that term really vividly and not people. Uh, so that dehumanization is often so often a prelude uh, for destruction. But I want to say um, two, two, two more things. First of all, the very important historical question about the re reactions of other Jews of the 16th century who were either Dorgeus Farad or from the next two generations of Jews who were descended from the uh, exiles from the Iberian Peninsula, uh, the tendency is much more to look inward because uh, Jews traditionally, and this even applies in some Jewish circles to post-Holocaust times, has been to internalize problems that actually have an external source. In other words, I'm not, if, if I blame the Spanish crown for bringing about all of the devastation of the Jewish communities in the Iberian Peninsula. What am I going to do about it? How, how can I possibly be empowered to undo the situation? Well, I can call on God to destroy my enemies. That's not going to work. I mean, it doesn't usually work. Or what I can do is I can internalize the problem in the most counterintuitive ways by saying, as always, the problem is Jewish sin. The problem is our defection from God. And so increased levels of observance coupled with profound penitence, teshuvah, will be the only solution that might lead me to my salvation and the reconstruction of my identity and the identity of my community. So there's this inward looking tendency uh, that you see again and again and again in the sermons of uh, Darby's contemporaries, who, by the way, many of whom had the exact same teacher in the same yeshiva in Salonika. And of course, there's a profound mystical turn, turn, which also is manifest in this interiorization or internalization of what you might otherwise view as existential that comes to fruition in the um, in the Kabbalistic circles in Tzvah. Well, who are some of the big players in the Kabbalistic circles in Tzvat? They're people who studied in the yeshivas in Salonika and Constantinople and then left there for Eretz Yisrael and resettled in Tzvat. People like uh, you would all know, for example, Levi al -Kabetz. Levi al -Kabetz, the author of L'cha Dodi and a very important mystical commentator, studied in the yeshiva in Salonika, had the same teacher as a Darby, moves to Eretz Yisrael and engages in a profoundly mystical quest that is uh, uh, built on inwardness and interiorization rather than this kind of virulence directed towards the other outside uh, and that represents an alt 
altogether different kind of spirituality that we find reflected in at least this sermon of a Darby's. Um, the other thing I want to say is uh, a comment on one of the one of the people who talked, I think, about dehumanization within the Jewish community. So I'm going to tell an anecdote, and I hope you don't take this the wrong way. But I used to teach every year for many years in the wonderful kalot of the um, uh, reform movement that uh, were, were sponsored by the what was then called the Union of American Hebrew Congregations. And um, they, were, they, were, they were just terrific. And one of the questions that came up from time to time is whether all the food should be hechsher, whether it should be kosher food. You know, I would just eat dairy, which is my typical conservative Jewish minhag when I would uh, be at one of these events. But people would occasionally say, you know, we're engaged in serious learning. We're engaged in a high level of the servant. Shouldn't we have kosher food? And uh, the, the rabbi, Oliver Sholem, who was responsible for running uh, these events, said, you know, in order to uh, guarantee that the food is kosher, I would have to hire a mashkiach, you know, someone who actually oversees the kashrut of the food that we're serving. And that mashkiach would be an Orthodox Jew. And now here's where the kicker comes in, who does not even respect me as a Jew. In other words, I would be hiring somebody to look after my diet who is disdainful of my Judaism, even at a moment when I am trying to observe kashrut. And then he went on to say something really interesting. In the reform movement, he said, maybe we should have standards of kashrut, but why should they be the same as that Orthodox Jew standards of kashrut? And then he said, I'd start with no veal. In other words, humane treatment of the animals and uh, maybe uh, 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 other other uh, kind of kinds of stipulations that you know gave rise to a movement later on that was called eco kashrut that you may have heard of uh, uh, was what he was talking about. But my point is that original rhetoric, that polemic that he said, why should I have somebody guarantee the kashrut of the food that I serve when that person doesn't respect me as a Jew? So it's still around. So if, with your permission, I'll continue. Okay, so let's look at Exodus 19. Everybody knows this text. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. I'm not gonna go on about the individual terms. I already mentioned that this seems clearly to be contingent, right? If it's Shamoa Tishma Ubakoli, you obey me, says God. Ushmar Temet Briti, you observe my covenant, then you shall be, consequence, Sigula, the treasure, Mikolha, me, Kili, Kola Arts. So we will turn first to Rashbam, who is not embroiled in uh, Jewish Christian disputation, uh, one of the Tosafists, the grandson of Rashi. All the earth is mine. This is, the, this is the standard kind of interpretation. Uh, in other words, everything in the world is God's possession under God's sway. And yet, you're the only ones I have chosen. And when it says kingdom of priests, uh, it looks like it could be a bit of an oxymoron because we tend to think of uh, kings as being of a political character, priests being religious leaders, and you know they're in conflict with one another, and never the twain shall meet, uh, which is interesting for a reason I'll get back to in a moment. He says, princes, as in this verse in 2 Samuel, Samuel Vene David Koanim, that is to say, the Davidites, the sons of David, were priests. Now, as it happens, and this is the aside, uh, in the ancient Near East, generally, the king was the titular head of cult or high priest, as it were, not necessarily as a cult functionary, but just in the same way that the American president is the titular uh, uh, commander in chief of the military forces, even though the president doesn't generally actually go into battle as the head of the troops. 
Um, so uh, it, it's perfectly appropriate as a matter of ancient royal ideology to associate kings with priests, even though the biblical narratives tend to draw a considerable distinction between them. And now the most famous of all comments on this notion of the treasured people, Ovadia Sforno, uh, a, a, a scholar who was imbued with humanistic knowledge, was familiar with uh, Christian biblical interpretations, and uh, his philosophical treatise is called Or Amim, Light to the Peoples, who saw the Jewish people as fundamentally having a mission to bring knowledge of God to the entire world. And that was what made them a priestly kingdom in their pedagogical function rather than their sacerdotal function uh, uh, as teachers. So, Kol Hamin Ha Enoshi Yakar Etzli. So the entire human race is more precious to me than the other lower beings. Look at the difference in language between, whoops, between Sforno and, come on, Sforno and, uh, oh, going the wrong way, that explains it. Sforno and, um, uh, and Rashbam. All nations are mine, I've chosen you exclusively. That's pretty perfunctory. But Sforno, uh, I'm going the wrong way. There we go. Not going where I wanted to. Just give me a moment. We'll use this. Okay. Uh, what we're talking about, first of all, is all of humanity. Okay. Uh, and then he says, as the sages said, Chaviv Adam Shenivra B'Tzela. So there's that vexing term again. Adam, which Sforno is clearly taking to mean all of humanity. So there's not a restrictive understanding of Adam that we saw in some of the earlier commentaries. But nevertheless, which is interesting, um, Mikol, uh, Mikol Makom, nevertheless, Anyway, so in other words, he's recognizing that there's something odd in God first uh, uh, extolling all of humanity as the most, uh, as the supreme among all creatures, and then selecting some portion of humanity and singling it out from the rest. Nevertheless, excuse me, you will be most treasured to me. You shall be to me a kingdom of prayer. And this is the way. Uvazeti yusigulami kulam. So, as my grandfather used to say, in the end, we'll all be Jewish. In other words, there is a Jewish mission, not one that's hostile to the Gentiles, but one that intends for their benefit. But it also intends for their benefit in the sense that it seeks to impose uniformity on them. There's only one right path, one right way, and we Jews have been vouchsafed that one right way so that we can convey it to others. Still, this notion of kingdom of priests as, as, as manifests specifically in a pedagogical function rather than a sacerdotal one, is very important and tremendously influential on later liberal Judaism. So let's move right along to alternatives, uh, among which I would include uh, the one that's signaled already by Secretary Albright in the passage with which we began. And I wanted to just bring the latest thing, you know, what are people writing right now? So here's Ayelet Naya, who's a clinical psychologist, writing in what is really an interesting issue of the newsletter that's produced by the Association for Jewish Studies, and there's the link. So you can simply go and read this on your own, it's online. And I say she's a clinical psychologist and she's bringing her professional expertise to bear on a way of understanding the Zoharic model, as she understands it, of the integration of the two sides. Uh, I'm, and I'm not gonna go into detail about that uh, because number one, we don't have time and number two, 
it's not my area of expertise, or shall I say, number one, it's not my area of expertise. And fortunately, we don't have any time anyway. But I think she says some beautiful things. The Zoharic model of integration directs us to take an interest in our adversaries, whom we might perceive as evil and as a threat to orderly existence as we see it. Yeah, like all of those behemot, like the a golem believed to Ra that we read about in the earlier commentaries, we must arrive at a deep understanding that our rivals also have a right to exist, needs of their own, and perspectives that for them are valid and true. Does that, if that doesn't resonate with the, our present political situation for you, I don't know what would, but that's where we seem to be right now, uh, where we just have it's almost impossible for those of us in this incredibly dichotomized, bifurcated political circumstance to uh, uh, empathize in the slightest with what other people think and believe. This outlook is different from a fantasy of coexistence built on similarity. I don't know if she's thinking explicitly of, of Sforno, but that's what Sforno is really uh, going, in which we hope that the other will accept our fundamental beliefs. I'm always reminded of uh, Ibn Ezra uh, in, in his famous hermeneutical statement about biblical interpretation, when he says the truth is like the point at the center of the circle. And even when I was a kid, it occurred to me to think, well, is there only one circle? I mean, it may be true that the truth is the point at the center of the circle, but what if there's more than one circle? What if our circle isn't the only one? And just raising that question already raises a kind of perplexity, a conundrum. So hoping that the other will accept our fundamental beliefs and we will therefore be able to live together in peace, it's a figment of the imagination. Otherness is real. Coexistence is forged out of the understanding that integration is critical and essential. The hated object, the personal, social, political other cannot be erased from the map or from our consciousness. And when she says from our consciousness, that's a profound reference to the opposing forces that we each of us experience within ourselves. It's not just between ourselves and that which is outside. The other can be within us, of course. We're tasked with recognizing its existence and with finding a way to live alongside it, weaving it into the great tapestry of divine, human, and psychological existence. That to me represents a profound expression of what's needful. Not that there's a prescription there of how to do it, because we've been trying to figure out how to do it especially since the enlightenment and especially since the rise of notions of social justice, whether they're based on, whether they're based on uh, providing people with what they deserve or compensating them for what they achieve or simply dividing everything equally or from each according to his abilities to each according to his need. Uh, whatever formulation you have turns out to be flawed irreparably in uh, trying to enact it. And that brings us to my last source, which is Alon Goshen Gottstein in this book that I, I recommend to anybody. It's a collection of essays that I think represent some of the best, most sophisticated thinking about chosenness and election, uh, brand new within the, just the past few months, Judaism's challenge, election, divine love, and human enmity. Uh, and, and Goshen Gottstein himself, who is the son of probably the greatest uh, scholar of the ancient Semitic languages of the 20th century in Israel, uh, is one of the most profound thinkers about interreligious uh, involvement. You can look him up on the web and look up his organization should you choose to do so. Kingdom of Priests provides an excellent prism for reflecting on Israel's particularity, especially in a contemporary context contains one of the fundamental tensions in understanding election, the tension between a status that is inherent unto itself and a mission that sees Israel's particularity as a function of its service to others. Do you have to choose between those two? 
or do you, can you somehow reconcile that? In other words, can we maintain a certain pride in difference, a pride in Jewishness, a recognition, recognition of uh, Jewish uh, uh, excellence without, uh, without the particularities of hostility to the other. It's not a hackneyed expression. So it can serve as an invitation to think of Israel's election and status through its particular complexities. And the first complexity that he adduces is the complexity of the relationship between our election and our level of traditional learning and observance. Can we speak of a kingdom of priests when large parts of the people do not follow the priestly vocation of dedication to God? Or uh, does election depend on a return to some form of spiritual, uh, some form of, uh, of, of traditional spirituality, some form of traditional Jewish observance, or you know, the idea of uh, expressed once profoundly by uh, my optometrist in Cincinnati, uh, when I asked him what synagogue he belonged to, and he gave me the name of the local Jewish golf club. Uh, that uh, probably isn't going to work from Goshen Gottstein's point of view. To reflect on what it means to be a kingdom of priests is an invitation to humility, given our failure, our inability to identify its meaning or to apply it. Yeah. In other words, to think about difference in hierarchical terms, to think about being better, because we're Jewish for some reason, which is something I was imbued with when I was growing up. To think about it in those terms uh, doesn't do any good unless it's accompanied by action that actually has the potential to improve the world. And it is this very humility, he says, that makes this category a promising category for recovering meaning and attachment to reality of being with God that can ascend to the greatest mystical heights, bring blessing and understanding to Israel and the entire world. So again, as in the case of Na'eh, I think it offers us a beautiful prescription, something to think on, something to act on, but not something that's easy to achieve, either at the level of the individual or at the level of our community. So with that, I think I'd like to conclude and, uh, uh, and uh, thank you very much for sticking with me and for your uh, patience. And I hope that uh, I have not caused you too much offense by adducing some uh, really, really difficult sources. Uh, nevertheless, they're all part of our tradition and hopefully they'll stimulate creative thinking on all our parts. Professor Cooper, do you wanna um, take a, a question or two in the remaining five minutes? Yes, or I think that that's why I stopped so that Great. Uh, if there are general questions or specific questions about, um, for clarification, I'd be happy to take them. Okay, great. Um, a few people were asking about this for no text and um, is, it, um, is it envisioning everyone being Jewish or something broader about everyone worshiping the same God? Uh, the former. In other words, there are sort of uh, fundamental Jewish principles that are rooted in biblical and rabbinic thought that uh, he thinks he belongs th to this uh, 16th century Italian Renaissance notion that the retrieval of the antiquity is incomplete if it only includes Greco-Roman antiquity, but that Ancient Judaism and biblical Judaism also are an integral and vitally important part of the ancient world that needs to be retrieved with its values being restored to active use in what he saw then as the modern, more collected humanistic environment. I mean, he's not saying we should, you know, bring all the, he's, he, this is not Isaiah 2. You know, we're, we're, we're chapter two, where we're going to rebuild the temple, and then all the nations are going to flow to it. And then, it's not that kind of naive notion of restoration, but rather something that anticipates the idea that the 
fundamental values that are encoded within uh, uh, scriptural laws and practices are of tremendous assets to humanity that should be adopted by all, hum all humankind. So uh, if, I, if I were to give my own example, for, uh, uh, which is not one of Sforno's, I would adduce, uh, for example, Moshe Greenberg's notion that Jewish difference in legal terms uh, in the ancient world was manifest partly in this idea, in the idea that no crime against property should be punishable by death. No one should ever be put to death for a crime against property. That's a value I would suggest that should be universal. So if I was Forno, I would be teaching and preaching that, and I would be an activist against any kind of any kind of uh, uh, legal activity or juridical or criminal activity that um, did that sort of thing to people. And there are all kinds of other sorts of things. Uh, let me take one more. Yeah, why not? Okay. Um, so a lot of people were sending me comments about how, you know, we're not the only ones who um, otherize uh, other groups, um, for lack of a better term, which is, of course, true. But I got a more uh, specific question that I thought you might be interested to answer, which is, um, do other, are, are there other groups or um, religions, historical traditions, uh, especially in ancient times that have this particular kind of origin story, um, you know, embedded in a narrative that leads to one, you know, one who's chosen and one who isn't that then sort of, um, you know, lays the groundwork for it for a national chosenness. I, I'm one thing that always, one thing that always, um, I'm always struck by in these sessions is the level of um, knowledge and expertise that people think I possess. I'm just a simple person who's a you know student of Bible and Jewish studies. <laughs> it's that's a great question. And if I were an historian of religions with the kind of breadth of expertise that I wish I had, I might be able to answer it. Is there excoriation on the part of various systems of, re of religion, of other systems of religion. Um, yeah, for sure. Uh, and that happens among the Eastern traditions as well as within the Western traditions. Uh, but is that based on an origin story? That is very hard to say. Uh, in the relationship between Catholicism and Protestantism, it's based on a shared origin story that is differently interpreted by the respective versions of what professes to be the self-same faith. So I, that's not quite an answer to the question, but that's a commonplace in the uh, history of religions as far as I know. And it's at the basis of what we call revivalism, right? Uh, Gershom Scholem talks about this in uh, Major Trends in Jewish Mysticism, where what is often couched as revival is often revolutionary. And the way in which you justify revolution is by claiming that all you're doing is restoring the original intent. Sound familiar, original intent? You're getting back to the source, which has been somehow corrupted by the history of transmission or by corrupt individuals who have put the source or the original sources to their own nefarious purposes instead of honoring them as they should have been honored. It's a, it's a wonderful question. It's got, my, it's got my head spinning, but I think I'm just gonna let it spin for a while. And you know, it's almost time for my whiskey. <laughs> um, all right, so, so sadly we've run out of time. There's so many more questions, especially about, about Christianity and Islam, but, but we're out of time, so we'll save them for another day. Um, I wanna thank you so much for teaching us. And, and you know, we talk, um, I think that the, the problematics of the concept of chosenness comes up a lot, but rarely do we, do we explore it by delving into, our, into, into close readings of text this way. So, so thank you so much for sharing, um, for sharing that, that refreshing and unique and nuanced way of exploring, 
of exploring a tough issue and, and the texts at the end were, were beautiful and, and redeeming from my perspective. Um, so thank you. I want to um, invite everyone to come back in two weeks. Next week, we're off for President's Day. Um, and I just, for those who are still on, stay on for one more minute, because I just want to tell you something cool about the series. Um, so we noticed when we were planning the series that the upcoming holidays this spring, or the, the spring holidays, Purim is coming up and then um, then Pesach and then Shavuot, that all three of those holidays um, very much have themes of otherness in them. So, um, so leading up to each of those three holidays, our session, our, our Monday session will um, explore the theme of the other in a way that relates to that holiday. So we'll have that for the first time um, in two weeks on February 22nd, uh, Dr. Shira Epstein will be teaching um, uh, her session is called Reading the Resisting Woman as Other, kind of in, um, looking at the Vashi narrative, uh, narrative from the Book of Esther. So I hope that you'll join us uh, for those and the other holiday sessions. Um, we'll miss you next week and we'll see you again in two weeks. Thanks for joining us and thanks again, Professor Cooper.